They call this the Dead Sea of Canada, Little Manitou Lake. It's so salty that only microscopic creatures can live in it. Rivers flow in but not out. Evaporation makes it even saltier. Farmers have long known not to plant crops on the shore. But there is a spa, like the real Dead Sea, and it's been here for decades. In the 20s and 30s, the people came from all over to visit Manitou Lake, uh, and they came and, and healed themselves in the water. They bathed in the water, put the mud on themselves for exfoliants, and it was very much a, uh, a health place. Saltwater lakes are well known in this part of the world. And aside from this one, where tourism and taking the waters has been popular for decades, they're seen as somewhat of a nuisance. But new research is showing that a lake like this with its saline waters may actually be performing a very valuable service. Researchers at the University of Regina say that such alkaline lakes, and there are hundreds here, absorb atmospheric carbon. Their complex chemistry stores the carbon in mud as a stable element. More than a million tons a year, up to a third of the vast carbon dioxide output of Saskatchewan's farms. Best of all, it's an entirely natural process. We don't have to do anything other than just make sure that we don't drain them, you know. Um, I think lakes have really been um, underappreciated in the carbon budget just because total surface area relative to oceans and forests they're not huge, um, but the rates at which they are processing carbon is far, far faster than, say, the open ocean. As oceans become more acidic, they sop up less carbon. These bodies of water are crucial then, and not just here. The Caspian Sea, the largest salty lake in the world, has similar chemistry. Environmental activists say this is exactly the kind of science that should transform our approach to the world's carbon problem. We need good applied science to figure out how we, how we actually achieve this. You know, if we can use the applied science to, to set out what we need to achieve, then we can hand over to the economists and the social scientists to figure out you know, the, the detail of how we get there. So far, governments aren't doing much with this research, but there's excitement building over how it might be applied if Canada ever draws up a plan to deal with emissions and atmospheric carbon and the salt lakes of the North American prairies could just be part of it. Daniel Lack, Al Jazeera, Little Manitou Lake. On land she bought for a dollar, Claire Fortin built a house of clay, stone and straw. It draws its power from wind and sun. She raises vegetables and fish to eat and runs a business that grows plants without soil hydroponics. She's one of dozens of residents here trying to live and work sustainably. The interesting thing about this spot is it's in uh, an eco-village which is attempting to be completely um, sustainable. This is a perfect place to do it because the rest of the inhabitants here are tending to be off-grid. This guy here, he dug his foundation with a pickaxe and a shovel. He's mixing his concrete in a wheelbarrow with a shovel. He's, he's my hero. Brent Kruger is a co-founder of the eco-village of Crake. His neighbor, his hero, lives in a buried shipping container. His home, also his business, a boarding school, manages to be both comfortable and environmentally sustainable. This whole place exists because rural Saskatchewan is dying yeah. and many communities around here are looking for ways to attract people into them. You know, the, the small towns are dying, the big cities are getting bigger. Burying a house in the ground to keep it warm in winter and cool in summer is something they used to do more than a hundred years ago, the early European settlers when they first came here. But what they're trying to do with technologies like this in the eco-village is bring people back to the countryside. This is an all too common sight in Saskatchewan. Once farm families drove on these streets and merchants, teachers and government workers lived in the houses. But farming changed, younger people moved away. Schools closed down, then businesses, and finally, entire villages. More technology in agriculture, uh, more chemicals, more pesticides, more productivity. This push of people out of the countryside that really comes from agriculture. Almost uniquely in today's Saskatchewan, Crake is growing, and not just in its eco-village. Across the highway in the main town, people are also buying houses. But to Brent Kruger, the reason for this rare success is obvious. 
that it's more than just the houses you build yep. and the energy you put in here. It becomes the food you eat. It becomes the travel you do. It becomes all of these things which are part of that 100%. That's what brought us out here. All around the rolling prairie landscape where much of the world's food is still grown, but by fewer and fewer people. Coaxing them to return and live here again is a challenge, but one that they're meeting in this community at least. Daniel Lack, Al Jazeera, Crake, Saskatchewan.